Mike Zipser here, and with me in the studio is Tom Doyle. Tom, welcome back to Fast Forward. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be back. Now, um, your latest book is The Wizard of Makatawa and Other Stories, a collection of your short fiction put out by Paper Golem. Yeah, that's Lawrence Schoen is the uh, editor and publisher, and he's done two previous collections of uh, short fiction. Uh, one was by Cat Rambo, and the other was by uh, Eric James Stone. And he's on a kind of mission to try to get authors' short stories before they go on and uh, maybe break through with novels or otherwise get authors who are kind of early on in their careers who wouldn't have an independent interest necessarily from someone else in putting together a collection. He wants to step into that niche and uh, it's, it's, um, it, it was great. I really, well, I was actually at various conventions when he was there and attending readings, you know, putting on my best stuff to try to sell him on the idea that maybe I could be one of those people. And sure enough, uh, he put this together and it has both uh, my Writers of the Future story, uh, While Ireland Holds These Graves, and it has uh, the story that won the WISFA Small Press Award, and uh, that's the title story, The Wizard of Makatawa. And there were two of uh, the stories that were uh, hadn't been published before. New oh, there, the there are three new stories. Oh, three? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, that's right. One is Noise Man, which uh, concerns, it's kind of an alt history or a crypto historical piece involving uh, first contact during World War II using technology that was just starting to become available and Alan Turing shows up in New York and such and uh, that one was a lot of fun. And then there's one that's just barely a genre piece, might not be a genre piece, called Sea and Stars and that was a favorite of um, Richard Paul Russo, one of my clarion instructors, was a real fan of that one early, so it's nice that it finally found a home. And there's another story that may be the first uh, kind of serious story I tried to do, and it took 10 years of rehashing and making it more and more twisted over time, and that one's called Sense of Closure. Yes, and finally yes. it became twisted enough, but by, <laughs> by that time it had gone through all the markets in less twisted form, and so this was the perfect place to, to put it. And it took you 10 years to do that one? Well, I kept on coming back to it. I go, you know, it, it's just not working quite right yet. If I just do this and I'd redraft it and then skip a few years and, and try, and, and finally I, I you know, did another rewrite for this collection. I think I finally got it. You know, the souffle was done at that point. <laughs> and that's the one, if I remember correctly, it's about the coroner. Yes, the, the world's the last, last coroner. coroner. And he really loves his work, yes. unfortunately. <laughs> yes, he does love, love his, his work. work, yes. You have, there's a few of the stories that are kind of twisted in this. Yeah, they, uh, that's and true. And there's one of them you said almost kept you from getting to Clarion? Yeah, that was Arts Appreciation. Yes. And the folks who were reviewing stories were worried that I was too similar to the protagonist of that one, um, who is a uh, kind of loner fellow who's um, engaged in a one-man war against the intrusion of advertising into his life through all the media. And he has the assistance of these various sort of AI bots that screen all his calls and rearrange his movies for him and do much more than he yeah. even knows consciously that they're doing. And uh, this all seems very fine and noble, but he steadily degenerates as the story goes on, even as his uh, life seems to become more successful as he goes along. So. Yeah, well, and he's a fairly disturbed, maybe even insane person. Yeah, at first he just seems mildly paranoid, and then it becomes clear he has other problems yeah. as well. And, you know, reading through the stories, that's one of the kind of themes in a f number of the stories is kind of finding work for crazy people in the future. Yes, <laughs> and uh, it became a theme, and uh, another story 
uh, crossing borders concerns oh, yes. a character who has borderline personality combined with a strong uh, antisocial sociopathic sort of issues and, and speaking, finding, speaking of twisted and finding her a job in the future and uh, she she does mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of in the J.G. Ballard mode. I, I've taken this thing to heart where he said about his characters that he tries to find resolutions that fit their needs or situations and not necessarily what the audience would judge to be the appropriate resolution for a character of that sort. And that's, I, I've taken that as a kind of motto for, yeah. for these people. And that was really a disturbing story in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not mature enough to read it, so I, I always give people the, the it, warning about that In some that ways, one. it's my favorite, and that concerns me. <laughs> it did very well. It uh, got, it was voted the most uh, popular story of its year in uh, On Strange Horizons. Right. A, a place that was full of very sorts of alternative yeah, stories. Yeah, it's a time. very interesting magazine. You've had your work in a number of, of some of the really most kind of happening, if I want to say that, um, kind of online fiction magazines around. Yeah, the, the kind of backbone of the collection is probably three stories that I did for Futurismic, mm -hmm. which had a very particular niche. They were near future, no aliens, uh, near earth, um, and society and technology sort of stories. And uh, Chris East was the editor at, uh, at Futurism, him and Jeremy Lyon was, uh, were the publishers and editors there. And they, um, I would write stories, after selling uh, one of them, I, I wrote stories oriented towards them. I ended up, I did the story Hooking Up, mm -hmm. was basically written, okay, I'm gonna write another Futurismic story. And they go, Tom, don't you wanna try the other markets? And I go, well, I, I tried like one or two, then after they said that and go, no, you know, this is for you guys. This is <laughs> your sort of thing. It's nice. Um, and one thing about the book is it was a great foreword by uh, James Patrick Kelly. Oh, wasn't that nice? He was yeah. so generous. He was one of my instructors at Clarion. He was the one who, um, he was there for crossing borders critique and he had been very threatening to myself and others that this is the blue line of death week, which meant that he was going to read until he got tired of something and mark it with that editor's blue line of death across the text. This is where you lose me. Oh, was that the infamous fourth week of Clarion? Uh, yeah, four, well, fifth and sixth, <laughs> oh. actually. So it was after um, what is usually the meltdown week. But yes, I was writing it during the fourth, <laughs> so it appeared during the fifth, that's right. And um, he, uh, and he, took it, that story, and he said, there's no blue line of death there. And then he read a quote from it. And I was like, Ooh. oh, there's something here. Th this <laughs> is good. good. This is good. There's good news for this late. In the oh. And I'd written it with a complete sort of, oh, you know, I'm I, under this pressure cooker. Of, I'll show all of you. I'm going to write something appalling, and you're, you're going to regret it. And uh, well, Why don't you talk a little bit about Clarion, because I don't know if everyone knows about Clarion. Well, Clarion is a six-week workshop for uh, writing science fiction and fantasy, and it is a boot camp. It is for authors who are reaching the point where they need just that extra push to go from writing to writing professionally and selling to the magazines, to getting going from that point where you're getting the nice personal rejection to the point where you make the sale. And it's, uh, I really advise it if people are looking to get over that hump and start selling stuff, I can't imagine a better sort of process to go through. Um, and it is about the process. You are writing and critiquing continuously and being critiqued. And there's some level of instruction, but it's really not about the top-down sort of uh, teaching that is driving the process. It's the pressure cooker of continually critiquing and criti continually being critiqued. And they get some of the top writers in the business coming in each week to work with the writers. Um, it's, 
it's stunning who they get. Yeah, we had, my year, we had Howard Waldrop, who is an amazing short story person. We had Richard Paul Russo, who's known for his Carlucci books in particular, among other things. We had Nalo Hopkinson, who's just a wonderful person, wonderful writer. We had really? Kelly Link and Gavin Grant. And we had Jim Kelly and Maureen McHugh. And uh, Scott Edelman was the editor in residence. And I mean, it was wonderful. You're working short fiction, and you had some of the I mean, Kelly Link and Howard Waldrop, you don't get better than that. <laughs> he was interesting, though, to have as the first oh, instructor yeah. because oh, yeah. it oh, wasn't yeah. about orientation. You were right in the middle of it. You know, yeah. you, this was in Media Race. Uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, just throwing, telling, the, wis the wisdom was coming down immediately, not this is how you do the critiques, this is how you, no right in the middle of it. So you, you come out of Clarion and you start selling your short fiction professionally and now you have, I understand, a contract for three books, novels from Tor. Yes, it's, uh, it just has happened in the last few months where I uh, have a three book deal. Uh, the first book, uh, based on the first book that I had finished and that book's American Craftsman and it is, I would describe it as a contemporary fantasy that has military and espionage elements, but it also is based on this his, another crypto-historical uh, use of American history and American literature as the backdrop. These characters have uh, families that stretch back to the founding of the, uh, the country and before, and they, um, in this first book, it's primarily these families out of New England who are famous, the, the Hutchinsons, descendant of Anne Hutchinson, uh, the Endicott's descendant of John Endicott, and the primary family, the Morton's descendants of Thomas Morton, who was a kind of uh, paganish figure in the middle of the Puritans and was always struggling versus them. So those are these founder characters and they, their descendants are still feuding amongst themselves, um, but they are practitioners, they represent a lineage of practitioners of magic in the service of the country. And uh, through military, through espionage, through various other means. Wow. And are the other two novels gonna be, you know, is this a series? Or? It is a series, so these characters will continue for at least three books. Um, I think the second book that I'm working on now is tentatively titled The Left Hand Way, and that's the euphemism for kind of the evil side of these various families and their practices are called the left hand. And these are sound like fantasy. They are fantasy, but they use a lot of science fiction tropes. And the characters in them, in fact, have to at various point think science fictionally about what they've been practicing as magic for a while. And uh, uh, there's a lot of use of science fictional metaphor and uh, situation. So because they are operating in the real world and they're firing guns and such, and so there is a certain, uh, that sort of realism. And no, there's no also elves technology. And but no the, elves and unicorns. No <laughs> elves and unicorns, no non-human magical mm -hmm. agencies. It's a very. It's just because your, your other work is Primarily science fictional, I would think. You have, I mean, even the Oz story, The Wizard of Makatawa, is really science fictional. It has, and that I think it's a good, gives you a good flavor of how American craftsmen, though it is a fantasy, will have science fictional tropes in it, you mm -hmm. know, in the way that that story did, The Wizard of Makatawa. And those can be. I really can really like the, when when there's fantasy elements that also have the science fictional feel. Uh, Michael Swanwick, yes, is is a master at that. Oh and yeah, and I I, I I really like his. Yeah, stuff. and uh, and so it sounds like that's got that element of it. It's got the the fantasy, but it's also feels like science fiction. It's it's very much in his vein, and I'm I'm, I'm a big fan of his. So. Now, do you have do you go back in history in it? Only in the tales that the current folks uh. tell. So they have to, in explaining in uh, where they go, they have to recall their ancestors and what has happened before because 
there was a struggle between uh, the Orthodox families, if you will, and the left-hand branches back in the 1800s before the Civil War, and that continues to echo down to the present day. And they're always continually remembering the past, remembering uh, Poe and Hawthorne were basically writing thinly veiled nonfiction about <laughs> these people. So there was a Roderick and a Madeline, but they weren't ushers, they were Mortons, and they were very evil Mortons. I, I, and, lo I love the, the secret history novels, the crypto history and all that. I, I'm a big fan of that. I just, I got to meet Tim Powers oh. out at the Writers of the Future Awards, and he is, I've, I've taken him to, I, I was writing in that mode, but I've taken him as validation of the way you do it is I was thinking that. you <laughs> assume that all the historical facts and dates have, are rigidly true and you mm -hmm. have to write around them. You have to s kind of ski solemn, uh, yeah, it's, it steer, steer between it's them. It's got to happen today, yeah. as in the real world today. In the real I world, and the, like, and the past that these characters remember has to work as a past. Yeah, Tim Powers, James Blaylock, yeah. you know, they do that, and I, I'm a huge fan of that kind of work, so I really am looking forward to it. So you've, you've got the first one turned in. The and first one turned in, it's gone to the production department as of this date. Um, so, uh, and that's looking for a May uh, a 2014 publication at this point. I'm not sure if that's firm, but that's what I've been told. Publishing, <laughs> it'll yeah, come so out when it, could, it comes out. And there should be books basically every year after that. If, Great. If, if it turns out that way. Yeah. Well, we hope it, hopefully it yeah, will. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it will. Uh, so do you, you've got it out for blurbs, I guess, and all that kind of pre It's been getting thing? some very generous, very attentive readings by, uh, by authors uh, like Eric Flint and Jacqueline Carey have uh, Great. been giving uh, blurbs for it, so I, and and many others. And uh, and I think I read that Claire Eddy is your editor. She is, and she's been marvelous. She's, she's great. Been, she's been absolutely. Uh, people talk about bad relations with editors. I have had nothing. She has done nothing but improve the manuscript. Uh, and it has been a great working relationship, and I hope it goes on and on. Well, this is. This is great to hear. Um, you'll have to come back on when uh, American Craftsman comes out. Well, I would love to. So yeah, and and I'm I'm really looking forward to the book. Uh, we're out of time. I want to thank you for for joining us here, and uh, congratulations. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Glad to do it. Well, that's it, and this is Mike Zipser for everyone here at Fast Forward saying, take care. <laughs>